The subject I'd like to speak about is vasovagal syncope, which is the common faint. And it really is very common. 40% of people will have a faint in their lives. And most of it is not very serious. At least that's what we think today. And uh, we should understand that vasovagal syncope has two components. It is the first, cardio inhibition, which means that the vagus nerve slows down the heart and may stop it, which is scary. The other component is called vasodepression, but it's mostly about uh, opening up blood vessels in the abdominal cavity and blood pooling there so it doesn't return to the heart and there isn't much blood for the heart to pump. So cardio inhibition and the heart stopping is potentially well treated by a pacemaker. The problem is the pacemaker does nothing for the vasodepression. And uh, very enthusiastic as we were in the 80s and 90s, we decided to attack the cardio inhibition. And we used pacemakers and we realized that attacks were infrequent, so they had to come on when necessary and uh, become silent and watching when not necessary. So the first couple of trials published in 99 and 2000 were amazingly good and we were encouraged, but we hadn't really thought it out well enough. And we were comparing an operation for something which is very suggestible. I mean, vasovagal syncope, you have to understand, can be caused by the sight of a needle or the sight of blood. So there is a brain component to this. And if we do something like an operation, it's, it's likely to be causing benefit for a while at least, because the patient naturally feels something's been done and I should be better. In any way, the condition is, is infrequent. It occurs very frequently at six per year, and most people get one or two in their lives. So that's a huge range of frequency. And when they've had a couple of attacks, as they tend to occur in clusters, they then tend to get better for a while. So there was a lot of criticism of our studies, and people said, we, we, all the patients should have a pacemaker. And half of them randomly turned off and the other half working so that everybody gets an operation. We take out that factor. That was done. Two trials showed no difference between having a pacemaker and not having one working. So they said, ah, we told you so. It's all placebo. But a few of us didn't believe that because we'd seen how patients benefit uh, when they're really in trouble, and we pursued it. So we said, we'll select them by knowing that they have very powerful cardio inhibition, so their heart stop naturally. They restart, of course, but they have to usually to get supine lying down for them to restart. So we, uh, we did a, a registry where we put in, uh, in likely patients, a loop recorder for the electrocardiogram. Didn't do any treatment, it just recorded. And these patients, of course, had more syncope. Eventually, we, we followed for a year. And uh, those that had syncope due to cardio inhibition, what disinformation was given to their carers, their GPs or cardiologists, and they could decide what was done, if anything. And the, the cardiologists decided to pace a lot of those patients. And they did massively better than when the decision was made not to do anything. So we said, okay, now we need a controlled trial. So we did that. And we found that pacemakers helped patients. But it was not a perfect result by any means. So we, we followed them for two years. And we had a 25% recurrence rate in those with a pacemaker working and 54% recurrence rate in those that pacemakers were not working. So this was statistically significant, but not powerful. And uh, uh, we, 
we were not very happy about this, but at least we'd shown in a, in a clinical trial sense that something good could be done. It's important to emphasize that these are older patients. The mean age was 63 in that controlled trial. And we didn't accept anyone under 40. This is relevant to this discussion. And uh, so w when we came to look at the longer term results, because all the patients were held in a registry, even those who refused to participate, they agreed to be monitored. And uh, we found amazing to us that the patients with uh, cardio inhibition on the ECG loop recorder, but had a tilt test before it was put in, and that was positive. They did badly. And those who had a positive loop recorder with cardio inhibition, but a tilt test negative, did very well. So then the argument was, ah, well, these patients don't have vasovagal syncope, but by every clinical means, they did. And uh, so we resist that, and we continue on this pathway. And then the next thing that happened was an Italian study of 10 uh, syncope centers, and they chose patients at mean age 70, and they did a complicated series of things, but in a way mimicked that controlled trial I just mentioned, which was called issue three. And what was found was something almost exactly the same as the issue three. So we said, now it's always good in science to have some uh, confirmation. Uh, now we're really onto something older patients with cardio inhibition, well documented, uh, can benefit from pacing. And it's important again to emphasize that we don't have anything on younger patients. So uh, the next event was called the Spain trial, which used a different kind of pacemaker. All those that I have discussed so far had a, a way of recognizing the slowing of the heart and only started to pace once it had been recognized. But the Spain trial had a, a pacemaker which detected something else, and that is the heart getting smaller, basically. But if there's less blood coming back to it, it will get smaller. And this happens before the heart slows. So an earlier intervention by the pacemaker might be good. And the Spain trial it took slightly younger patients, but nobody under 40. The mean age was 53 versus 63 and 70 in the two previous things I mentioned. And uh, the Spain trial was outstandingly effective. They compared the pacemaker working, set in a normal way for that kind of pacemaker, with a, a pacemaker that would deliver a heart rate of 30 if it had to. So the heart rate had to fall below 30 for it to work. And in, in these uh, 46 patients, uh, three had recurrent symptoms, syncope. And in the sort of non-working mode, 21 had recurrent syncope. Now that was good statistical significance. And they followed up for two years. So we, we thought again, now this is good information uh, these kinds of patients, possibly younger, could be helped. But they didn't use a loop recorder. So we, we have tilt tests showing cardio inhibition, but no loop recorder confirming it. And uh, the, historically, that is what the patient complains about, was not exactly the same as had been in the issue three trial. So a few unanswered questions, but more and, and better confirmatory information. And uh, now we have uh, the Biosync trial going on, which is, again, that same kind of pacemaker as the Spain trial. Uh, larger numbers, there'll be 128. So far, I think they've re recruited 116. So it's nearly at its end. And we'll be able to see a comparison between that pacemaker working in the way it normally would versus in the patient, but not working. And that's where we are today. So would I recommend a pacemaker for a young patient? No, because there's no information 
to support it. But we do see patients who are very disabled by vasovagal syncope. And what to do for them? Well, we could put in a pacemaker. We'd be working against the guidelines if we did. But I think there could be some, and I have paced some, who really merit it because of the severity of the symptoms. And so then we need a second opinion before an implant. And uh, if that agrees with the first opinion, then the patient might accept. Uh, I think this is a very delicate issue when there's no information to guide us. But sometimes one has to do the best one can for the patient. And the, the worries are that I mentioned earlier, that very symptomatic patients, they all tend to get better. How much better is the question. Um, so we, they come when they're at their worst. This is reasonable. And time will be somewhat of a healer. Um, young patients are different in the sense that there are different things about their attacks. And they do tend to improve. And they, when they reach early middle age, most of them have no fainting. May come back when they're 60, 